You wanted a striker. I wanted a striker. But maybe a striker isn't on the menu anymore. We've got an Arsenal exit to potentially talk about. Liverpool. Oh, Liverpool. And, of course, the Arsenal News Show will continue with plenty more to discuss as well. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is the Arsenal News Show. Joining you every single morning at 8am UK time. Thank you as always for joining me and making this a part of your morning routines. It's incredibly appreciated. I hope you've had a fantastic week. It's Friday, which means of course the weekend is here. Which means that Premier League action is back and we'll be back this weekend, of course, with Arsenal taking on Aston Villa on Sunday. We've got to wait all the way through to the end of it. In fact, Arsenal are indeed one of the last uh, kickoffs of the weekend. We've got Monday, uh, Chelsea against Everton, but tomorrow, Newcastle Spurs. We've got Manchester City, Luton. Then Sunday, it's Liverpool Palace. And of course, Arsenal ending the day at 4.30 against Aston Villa. So Arsenal certainly have the toughest test this weekend, and it will be certainly something of a you know, we need to hope that Arsenal get the job done. Um, but uh, yeah, who knows? I guess we'll have to wait and see um, how Arsenal end up getting on in this one. But good morning to those joining us in the chat. Thank you so much, as always, for doing so. I hope you've had a fantastic day and week thus far. And if you would be ever so kind, to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new around here with those notifications turned on so you never miss a show. Let's say hello to some people joining us in the chat box. We've got Sweat and Merlo, Input, Stevie, Malvin and Maker. Uh, we've got Dylan and Pika Who. We've got Arsenal Adventure, Angela. Uh, we've got Rob. Uh, we've got Errol. I see Brad. We've got Carl, Rich, Rob, Paul, Kim, Adam. Thank you so many guys and girls for tuning in as always. Um, and we're very close. In fact, there's even a chance. There's potentially a chance. It's only a small chance um, that we are seven subscribers away at the time of recording from 56,000. So... Who knows? Maybe by the end of this show, we'll hit it. So if you are not subscribed and tuning into this for the first time, maybe you'd be ever so kind to press that subscribe button because we're very close to that 56,000. Right. Uh, let's jump into today's stories, shall we? Uh, and we start with Europa League action. We're not going to go into, uh, into any fine details about all the other games and stuff by Leverkusen beating uh, West Ham 2-0 and absolutely dominating David Moises. So I think that's something like 30 33 shots to West Ham's one. Something crazy. Um, West Ham will, of course, host by Leverkusen next week. Um, but, yeah, kind of madness, really, to, to see how good Leverkusen are at the moment. But despite all the hype, despite all of the emotional storytelling that Liverpool fans tried to give us about a Europa League final against Bayer Leverkusen, Xabi Alonso being more of a spectacle than anything the Champions League could throw up this season, and despite all of the overconfidence, all of the stick that Arsenal got after their 2-2 draw with Bayern Munich on Tuesday, well, Atalanta didn't just score one. They didn't just score two. But they scored three goals at Anfield in a 3-0 victory, which, of course, they will take back to Bergamo, um, looking to progress to the semi-finals of the tournament. Gianluca Scamacca scoring a couple and Pasilic with another, the former Chelsea player, of course. Uh, a rather damning, damaging and darn right enjoyable result from an Arsenal perspective. I think Arsenal fans have just been very frustrated with the way in which they've been spoken about by some, uh, a fair few. Liverpool supporters, Arsenal continuously being scrutinised, Liverpool being kind of looked at as this golden child of a club and that they can do no wrong, basically. And just seeing that, reality brought back with quite a loud thud, um, I think has been very much appreciated by the majority of the Arsenal fan base. Now, moving into more Premier League news and unanimously clubs have voted for semi-automatic offsides to be introduced into the league next season. This is the technology whereby additional cameras are placed into every Premier League ground and using modelling of the players throughout the game, uh, offsides can be called much quicker, much easier and much more accurately as well without the need necessarily for officials to draw lines. We shouldn't see as many mistakes. There is a catch, however, um, and the catch is that these won't be implemented until after the first autumn international break. Um, despite these being voted in April, there isn't a chance, there isn't a possibility 
that uh, they'll be able to implement it at the start of the season. So for some fans, they're arguing, well, if you can't implement it at the start of the season, wait until the next season, because otherwise it's not, you know, there could be mistakes at the start of the season, which then aren't made uh, throughout the rest of the season. So you kind of got to make it even across the campaign. From my perspective, I think I'd just rather have it implemented as soon as possible to try and eradicate the mistakes as soon as possible. I understand the argument. Um of not having it implemented, um, you know, of, of it being annoying that it's not being implemented or that it maybe should be implemented when you can only do it at the start of the season. But I kind of think, you know, bringing it in as soon as possible is still going to eradicate more mistakes throughout the course of the season. And to be honest, offsides aren't necessarily something that officials should be getting wrong. I know they have, you know, it's not to say that they haven't got them wrong, they have. But if it speeds things up, and that's kind of the main thing, um, that's kind of, a good thing to be implementing into games as well. Uh, Braden Clark has actually been speaking to the Arsenal website and talking specifically about his move to Arsenal. Of course, he joins the club as one of the few signings that Arsenal actually ended up making during the course of this season. Uh, he left Wolves towards the end of last year and uh, joined Arsenal with the hope of, of progressing through the team. Uh, he wrote an article on the Arsenal website, which of course you can read in its entirety. I'll just give you a couple of insights from it, but it is available on the Arsenal website to read. He says, I describe myself as a ball-playing centre-half who likes to get the ball down and play. But to me, the most important thing is to keep the ball out of the net. I'll put my all into defending uh, blocks, tackles, headers, whatever it takes. I take pride in defending. I look at centre-backs in the first team like Saliba and Gabriel, who are amazing talents. They play at such a high level and it's no surprise why the first team has such a good defence. They're both consistent and are a great partnership. My plan for the rest of the season is to continue settling in with the squad, as I've still only just joined. Being at Wolves for such a long time, it's a new experience for me, and it'll take some getting used to. But the players and staff have been brilliant with me. So Braden Clark is certainly a player to look out for, young 16, I think, year old, centre-half at this point in time. And uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly to be uh, plenty to be excited about with, with him, who's exceptionally highly rated, and it was seen as something of a coup when Arsenal managed to get him on a free contract because there was a lot of interest in the player. Uh, moving into transfers, we've got a couple of stories to discuss this morning. The first one being probably one that isn't going to be too welcomed by Arsenal fans, and that's on Charlie Patino. Uh, Nizek Kinsella of the Evening Standard reported yesterday that uh, he is expected to leave on a permanent deal in the summer. This follows on from reports that came out last summer. I certainly chased up this story last summer and it seemed like he might leave on a permanent deal then. The opportunities or the offers that came forward didn't necessarily match the scenario. They didn't ever kind of fulfil what either the player or the club were looking for at that time. This summer, he has a year left on his deal after Arsenal activated that clause in his contract. The pathway to the Arsenal first team is near impossible for Patino at this point because not only have you got so many midfielders with the possibility that Arsenal will look to sign a midfielder in the summer, you've also got players like Ethan Nuneri, Lewis Mar uh, Miles Lewis Skelly, that are coming through as well. And so there just simply isn't a place for Charlie Patino now. And for a player that looked to be potentially someone who was really looked at as, as having a clear pathway through into the squad, it's closed. And it shows, I think, and highlights how quickly things and environments can change at youth level and how doors can suddenly shut on you when you least expect it. But Patino needs to move permanently in the summer. Arsenal will be looking to get as much of a fee as possible for him. Um, I saw some tweets in response to the news like about how Arteta supposedly ruined another uh, youngster. That's, that's not the case. Things change very quickly. He's been on a couple of loans. He's not necessarily playing too much for Swansea either in the second half of this, scene, uh, this season. So expecting him to come in and be a force for Arsenal in the coming years based upon what he's done on loan, I don't necessarily think there is enough evidence to suggest that would be the case. But he's certainly good enough to be a championship player at the moment. Maybe a lower-end Premier League player if indeed he finds the right environment. But a uh, a, um, a summer exit is, is what is being expected of. And our main story to discuss today is that, according to John Cross, who wrote a piece in The Mirror yesterday talking about a number of topics, which you can read in full, of course, on The Mirror website. Um, but a point that I wanted to pick out in particular was the viewpoint of Kai Havertz. Now, suggestions are that Kai Havertz's success, especially at the centre-forward role, may have changed the stance that Arsenal have on transfer plans. Now, that change of stance was not that they wouldn't be signing a striker, necessarily. Um, it could mean that if Arsenal don't find the right profile, of course. But mainly, what this is talking about is kind of how they go in to approach the striker signing from a marquee perspective. So, is the idea of Arsenal signing a striker, a marquee, top, top striker on the table? 
I'm not so sure if it necessarily will be on the table come the end of this season in some of the window. But what they might choose to do instead, because of the success of Havertz, is to look at more of a younger profile, as I have suggested and reported on Football.London before, that they end up looking at to try and nurture and grow and develop into a future star. So you're looking at young 20s, not, you know, I'm seeing people in chat saying like, Liao, no, that's not the type of profile that it would be. It wouldn't even be necessarily a Jokerez type striker either at 25, 26 come the end of this season. It would be more... It would be more chance of a, what's the word? Uh, a tw- not even what's the word, but just the age bracket. It would be more of a 20-year-old, like a Benjamin Sesco, I guess, an Evan Ferguson type. I don't think Ferguson would be that because of the price tag that would go alongside it. But Sesco, I think, probably stands out as the age profile, the potential price tag that is there as well available for him. So that type of profile would make more sense. And it's a credit to Havertz, who, of course, has scored the most Premier League goals he's ever got in the league during his time in England more than he's ever managed with Chelsea. And the season, of course, is far from finished at this point also. And he played the majority at the start of the season, of course, if you remember, in midfield. Um, So he's only recently moved into that centre-forward role. So that is certainly something that I think is changing in regards to that. There isn't actually a market necessarily for a guaranteed win in centre-forward. You know, your Victor Rosamens aren't guaranteeing you whatever you might have been able to get from them if we'd have signed him last summer. I think he's shown this season a dip in his form. Jokerez, of course, a player that I like a lot and would be keen on Arsenal signing, but there's always a certain risk with that deal. You know, he's, of course, shown that he can step up from the Championship to Portuguese League and European football, scoring tons of goals and getting tons of assists as well. But there's no guarantees like there necessarily was. I've said before, like, there isn't a Declan Rice for the striker this summer. And so because of that, Arsenal looking to a younger forward. I think Sam Dean it was in January as well, reporting that Joshua Zerkzy was another player that Arsenal were looking at of um, uh, of Bologna. Bologna? I think it's Bologna. Um, he's had a very good season, of course, formerly of Bayern Munich as well. So it makes sense, I think. Uh, and that's really important to consider when the striker talk emerges because there just isn't a profile that gives you that Declan Rice guarantee like we had with the midfield in the summer. And also for me, I actually think the midfield and the wide areas are really important priorities for Arsenal in the summer and perhaps are outweighing the striker a little bit because of the success that we've had with Havertz this season. So that's certainly something to look at. It is the final day, of course, that you can get involved with the massive prize um, to win a signed, not signed, but a you, know, you can win a, a ticket uh, to get on the private jet of football prizes that will fly you off to the European Championships this summer. Uh, Available to win is two tickets to not only the private jet, uh, departing from Manchester private terminal to Cologne from the 24th of June and returning also on the private jet on the 26th of June from Cologne private terminal. But you also get two nights accommodation in Cologne and two tickets to England against Slovenia at Euro 2024. Brilliant prize. But this is the final day that you can get a ticket. It is UK only, of course, as always. Tickets are down in the link in the description. Best of luck to anybody that has entered. I wish you all the best luck in the world. And I can tell you that of the 49,000 tickets that are available, only 11,000 over have been sold, which means if you buy a ticket, you've got probably a, a five times, is it how it works? <laughs> I suppose five times less tickets than are available were uh, on offer. So you've got a very good chance, <laughs> you know, in terms of compared to if you've bought uh, a ticket that went for 49,000 tickets were sold out. But because uh, only 11 were, you got a much, much better chance as well. So there you go. Best of luck. Um, right, let's go to part two and your questions then right after this. Okay, part two. Let's jump into the chat box and tackle some of these comments. Um, Dickens says, Arteta is not integrating and hasn't really integrated any academy player. We'd have to accept that he's a checkbook manager. Oh. <laughs> I mean, Dickens could obviously not be further from the truth in reality because not only has he integrated and established the likes of Bakaya Saka and Gabriel Martinelli, of course, who previously were not necessarily established players when he took over at the club, you know, in terms of the minutes that he's given to those. Smith Rowe, of course, he did establish as well during one of his important seasons before Martinelli then took over that more left wing position. But also, we've seen him have such success with players that he has signed, yes, but. Giving players debuts is not necessarily going to give you the 
the, the wipeout of that claim that you're a checkbook manager. I, that is a ridiculous claim. Because, I mean, specifically, the ironic thing is that he spent far less than obviously the likes of Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp in comparison to the amount of time they spent at their clubs is also an important point. But he's given debuts to young stars. He's given debuts to academy graduates. But there is something to be said about are those graduates that are available good enough? Has there been the level of quality available for him to give debuts to? Like, if you look at the Manchester City team at the moment, you've got Phil Foden and you've got Rico Lewis. They're really the only two that Pep Guardiola has given debuts to that have stuck, right? That have really worked. Now, I don't think in the time that Arteta has been manager, we have had a player that has been good enough to establish themselves. The closest we probably had was Balogun. And we made the right choice in selling him because obviously he's gone to Monaco and he's not, I don't think he's made good on the £35 million with that sell-on clause we've got as well yet that was worth it. He was probably the biggest talent that we had that we've let go of. Um, and we got a very good amount of money for that as well. He gave him, of course, a debut, did Arteta, gave him that debut um, in the Europa League initially, I think it was, before he actually got some minutes in the Premier League as well. I think he's made seven, we've got since seven debuts being given to academy graduates. Patino, of course, being one of those as well. Uh, ben Cottrell, we had Ethan Nuaneri, we've had Carl Hine, we've had, um, who's the other one? There's one more that I'm forgetting as well. Is it a defender? I think it might have um, been a defender as well. But the point of the, fa the matter of fact is that we've not seen those players get established. And the reason being for that is, A, they haven't necessarily been at the level. B, there has been so much pressure for Arsenal to progress immediately that you can't do that. Man City have more of a luxury to be able to do that. Even Liverpool have had more of a luxury to play some of the youth stars. And they've had better youth stars. You look at the Liverpool youth team, they have been competing at the highest levels of youth, uh, youth academy football for a long, long time. And Arsenal now are shifting Charles Sago Jr. At, Brent, at Brentford. Thank you, Daniel, um, as well as a point. But there is a shift this summer into an investment in more youth players. We're seeing that with the signing of Braden Clark that we already discussed in part one. But to suggest that Arteta is a checkbook manager, goodness me, just completely takes things out of context. Uh, Sankey says, Tom, the number one position that needs strengthening is right wing. Saka needs to be rested more often and to get the best out of him. And 90% Saka every game is not great. I agree. And as I mentioned in the first part, the centre midfield area and the wide areas are definitely other priorities to this summer. Uh, and he says, should we be looking to get experienced Champions League players in? We look like a deer in the headlights sometimes on Champions League nights. You're obviously going to get more experience as we play more games in the Champions League. There's absolutely nothing wrong with signing players in the Champions League. And I think Joshua Kimmich stands out as one of those that we should probably be looking to sign in the summer as well. Um, Morgi says, Tom, concerned about Villa. We got a bit of run. We got a bit of a run around on Tuesday, which was demoralizing, even with the equalizer for the players and fans. We all have to be back in and forget Wednesday. Uh, I, to be honest, I think, Morgie, there is something to be said from the previous question that was asked about the Champions League. It's a different game. It's a different sport almost playing in Champions League football. Arsenal returning to Premier League action, I think they'll remember and be much more aware of what is on offer, what the league is, what the, the different style is. And Aston Villa, of course, are missing Douglas Luiz. They've got a bit, bit of a midfield crisis because there's no camera, there's no Luiz, there's no Ramsey. Uh, Dendonk has obviously left as well. And they're going to have to make some interesting choices, Emery will, in midfield. So I think we'll be OK at the weekend. Uh, Clive says, who would be your choice to play with Rice, assuming that we have to spend and spend big? And there was another question from Clive about Rice. He said, do you think Rice is best at a six or an eight? Or are you not bothered as he can do both? To be honest, Clive, I think it's I think it's actually a lot to do with the future plan in terms of the recruitment for the midfield. I think Rice is excellent in both roles. There is something to be said about do Arsenal need their own? I think you might have raised this actually in the vision. I need to listen back to the week, but I think I saw a clip going out. So I don't want to steal your thunder too much, but I think you raised a good point about the Rodri. Arsenal need their own Rodri style player where if this guy plays the chances of you losing are infinitesimally small. And it usually comes from players playing in those defensive midfield positions. They can be such crucial players. Like when Liverpool had a Fabinho who was absolutely fantastic, he was the bedrock of their, you know, their when they were winning those big trophies. Sadly, things changed for Fabinho. But I feel like if they'd have had a Fabinho at the same level that they had him during those years where they won the league title and won the Champions League this season, you might have seen an even more astounding Liverpool than we've seen um, rise up through the table compared to last season's performances. So I think that's a fair point. But I think it depends also about kind of the, the, the recruitment that we make into midfield. If you can go out and sign a Declan Rice level player 
at six, Rice is good enough to play with that person but play ahead of them. But if the option is actually a player that can come in and play as a, a better eight and a better box-to-box, then Rice can look to specialise more as the deeper six. I think that there's scope for us, of course, to keep one of Jorginho and Partey next season. So we've got kind of a tick over. Kimmich, of course, if we can't find that key player, can come in and be, I think, again, that midfielder that can play with Rice and allow Rice to be further up the field as well. Because Kimmich is just so good at reading the game, at tackling, at judging player movements and tackling at the right time. I think you can play Rice and Kimmich very successfully together also. Um Let's go to Brad says he's a coach, not a checkbook manager. He makes too uh, he makes too many people better to be. He's absolutely right. Like to describe him as a checkbook manager absolutely takes away from his coaching. It takes away from what he's done to improve players. I mean, you look at the improvements of of Ramsdale as a goalkeeper as well. You look at the improvements of uh, of Raya as a goalkeeper. You look at the improvements of Saliba as a player. Uh, Gabriel, look at the improvement of Gabriel. My goodness me, as a player. Tommy Asu came in from the Serie A, relatively unknown, and is now a player that we'd love to be starting away at Bayern Munich on Tuesday. I think the majority, or on Wednesday rather, the majority of us would have him there also. Look at Ben Wyatt, who's not only been made better, but has been helped to transition to one of the best right backs in Europe. You look at the pro- improvements of a player like Saka, a player like Erdegaard, who's been unlocked. His potential has been absolutely unlocked here. Martinelli came in as a six million player under Unai Emery, showed great talent under Unai Emery, but has been absolutely fulfilled, uh, especially last season. He has had something of a dip this season, but last season is specifically Arteta got the maximum potential for him. And look at what he's done with Kai Havertz. I mean, just have a look and see how he's been able to give him such freedom and rediscover some of his best form as a player that we were seeing at Bayer Leverkusen and then weren't under the likes of Thomas Tuchel, who is a good coach, but you know didn't necessarily see that under him or under Frank Lampard, of course. So it's a testament to the coach that Arteta is as well. Uh, Pika Who says, FYI, it's my birthday today. 21, 29 years young. Well, Pika Who, it's a good age, I can tell you that. Very good age indeed. But uh, happy birthday, my friend. And thank you being thank you for being such an uh, ever so dedicated listener to the channel. And speaking of new members, UG, uh, or Huey? Huey? UG? You have to tell me, UG, um, how I'm pronouncing that correctly. Maybe it's an Irish name. Maybe you have to let me know how I pronounce it. But uh, thank you so much for becoming a brand new member and welcome to the TGT family as well. Uh, Ashmouse says, what are the odds of Emery putting teams together like Jenkins and Mavropanos Mustafi-esque lineups, just like he did against Crystal Palace when we were going for the top four? Yeah, I mean, there was a focus really of Europa League with Emery at the end of that season, and it really cost us Champions League qualification. It's something I'll never, ever forgive Uno Emery for, is, is absolutely chucking the, in the bin our top four race that season. Uh, Craig says, we can't complain about not getting silverware and then complain that academy players aren't getting enough game time to develop. Arteta surely has to prioritise, and this is so spot on. You can't have it both ways. What I will say is that there's definitely a point of contention with the youth side of things. There's definitely an argument that he can do more, I don't think that's that's um, that is certainly not something that is uh, a moot point. Arteta could and has had opportunities to do more with youth. There have been games where he could have given them game time. I'm thinking Amario Koja Dubri in Wolves on the final day of last season. Nothing game, couldn't get anything from it. He was on the bench. We were 4-0 or 5-0 up or whatever it was. He didn't get any minutes. Lawns at home this season. Arsenal winning 6-0 against Lawns in the Champions League um, in the group stages. I think it was 5-0 at halftime. On the bench that day, we had Ethan Maneri. We had Miles Lewis Skelly. We had, you know, these players there. And we didn't give them opportunities. We could have given them opportunities in that game and didn't. So there's been opportunities that he hasn't taken. So he definitely can do more. But it's not a point of contention for me, the Arteta youth side of things, especially. I know it's rearing its head because of the Patino story, but suggestions that we saw earlier, like he's a check, but manager just fall on deaf ears. Um, Derek says, hey, mate, are we qualified for the Champions League next year? Uh, Timber on the bench this weekend, question mark. Are we qualified for the Champions League? No, we're not. There is still on offer 21 points, which means a maximum. We need to be 21 points clear of fifth. And we're not. We're 11 points clear of fifth. So until we get to a point where we are as much of a gap with the few points remaining, yeah, we're still not uh, in a position to uh, to be claiming that we are uh, by any means Champions League qualified at this moment in time. Will Timber be on the bench? No idea. 
Uh, and Clint says, Tom, do you think Tim will play the under-21 team this weekend or will he continue training with the first team till Arteta sees fit to give him some minutes? Of course, there is an under-21s game, I think, on Monday. Who knows? We might see him there. I'm surprised he's not been given an opportunity yet, but of course, I'm not in and around the training ground. I don't know um, his progression. I don't know where he sits. We don't want to rush him back. We want to be very careful. And that's really, really important. Uh, Sean says, you are putting a coach under pressure to win, to win now, and then you still want him to be playing untested and untrusted uh, kids, uh, we can't eat our cake and have it too. Indeed. Uh, Ryan says, personally, I'm glad that we got the errors for the two goals the other night out of our system. I wouldn't want to drop those points in the league. I suppose that's it's an important point and we maybe learn from those mistakes. There was some naivety in the game defensively against Bayern, definitely. Um, and I'm hoping that it's going to be important that we did that in the first leg and we did it in a game in which we didn't lose as well. We managed to come back and hopefully that's given us a foundation as well. Uh, Dickens responding to his earlier comment about Arteta being a Chetbrook manager says, no one is questioning his coaching capabilities. I have no issue with that. I just love how Kobe Mainu does his thing on the other side. Uh, Dickens, there's a very good reason why Kobe Mainu is being able to do his thing at Manchester United. Do you want to take a guess? Do you want, anyone want to take a guess how, why indeed Kobe Mainu is able to do and get the minutes that he's getting at Manchester United? Anyone? Anyone in the chat box want to have a go at it? Because I'll give you, maybe I'll give you a couple of minutes and then you can come, I'll see your responses. It, what is the reason beyond just his talent, which is obviously there, but is there a reason as to why Kobe Mainu was able to get a pathway straight into the midfield of Manchester United far faster than maybe some of the other youngsters in the Arsenal team would have been able to get opportunities as well. Um, Damien says, I think we should do an Arteta press conference sweepstake. I'm, <laughs> I'm bagging on the uh, square with, uh, we have one more training session, so we will see what happens. That's a go-to. Arteta, of course, will be facing the press a little bit later on this afternoon. Early this afternoon is Arteta's press conference at the Sober Realty Training Centre. We'll break down everything from that, of course, on tomorrow morning's show. And we'll have all the live updates for you on the press conference blog on football.london, which I'll be running with Kai Kainak, who, of course, will be at the training centre to hear from the Arsenal manager. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Aweg Bruce says, Sunday's match is very important. We need to win it. I hope they prioritise it more than the Bayern return game as well. And Amira says, has anything Partey done since returning from injury shown us why he has to start against Bayern? Or are we more relying on what he could potentially provide? Yes, absolutely, Amira. The pass to Erdegaard against Manchester City, the pass through to Saka in the end of the game against Bayern. His passing breaks lines. His passing is something that we don't really have in our midfield. He's a different type of player to what we have with Declan Rice. And I think that a Partey-Rice combination against Bayern Munich will give Arsenal that ability to break through that Bayern midfield, especially on the counter. So yes, we have seen things from Partey that I would quite like to see uh, there as well. Um, some of the, I was hoping for maybe some better <laughs> responses, but I will read this out. Benny says Man United are poor. Robert says Man United are pony. Mr. Reese says they're just pretty crap, um, <laughs> which I absolutely understand. But I absolutely think the uh, Sabah says because there was a lot of injuries in their top players. It's not even that, right? Um, if I tell you what Manchester United's midfield this season is, especially the deeper part of the midfield, which Kobe Mano, of course, plays as kind of this deeper player that can play box to box and go forwards away, plays in the, the pivot, of course, and plays slightly maybe in the, the rice type role ahead of a, a Jorginho, if you like. But they brought in a player in the summer that a lot of Arsenal fans wanted, a lot of Arsenal fans wanted. And his name is Sofian. Amrabat. Now, I was told time after time after time in the summer that we should absolutely be going for Sofian Amrabat because he was a player that would be offering Arsenal loads of quality, loads of depth to the midfield, and of course was only available for a small fee or on loan from Fiorentina. He has been awful, awful for Manchester United this season. Not only that, but despite the fact that they've relied on Scott McTominay's goals in certain parts this season, he's not particularly from a defensive side of things or from a consistent side of things, had the best of seasons. Casemiro has not been particularly great either, especially from a fitness reason. And if you certainly look at those three players in particular, Amrabat, McTominay, Casemiro. If you're talking about the mobility of these players, if you're talking about the ease at which they move through the midfield, they close down players, there's a problem. Kobe Manu is energy. Kobe Manu is somebody that adds them a lot more into that midfield from a mobile perspective. And they simply don't have those options. They, he is a standout candidate to come into that team because of the profile that he is and because of the lack of quality that they have in that midfield and the, in the unsuccessful signing that was... Sofian Amrabat as well. So, absolutely, Kobe Mainu, I'd love for Arsenal to have a similar story under Arteta. And I think that we could do in the future with someone like Ethan Nuneri. Uh, maybe, um, 
uh, maybe Miles Lewis Skelly. Who knows? Maybe some of our even younger players like Chido Obi Martin and Max Doman, who are showing some really great talent. But I don't want to pipe them up too much because people get carried away very quickly. But to, to say that Dickens, as you were saying earlier, for, to call Arteta a checkbook manager and then for the argument to, to be that the reason why we're calling him that is because he hasn't given youth opportunities and you want to see something like Kobe Manu. The only reason why Kobe Manu is able to get the opportunities that he's got and the pathway he's got beyond the talent that he obviously does have is, of course, because that midfield is so, so decrepitly absent of uh, of mobility and and certain to do a, uh, to a degree consistent quality and the in, unsuccessful signing of Amrabat as well has contributed to that. Compare that to Arsenal's midfield. You know, if we're talking about Nuaneri trying to get opportunities as an attacking midfielder, Odegaard starts and plays the majority of every single game because he's captain. Behind him, you've got a £34 million signing in Fabio Vieira and then a Hale graduate that everybody loves in the Mill Smith row. Go slightly deeper into the box to box positions. We signed Havertz at the start of the season, who was playing there as well. And gradually, we've changed the structure of that midfield that Smith Rowe can come into that position. And then you've got Declan Rice, Thomas Partey, and Jorginho as well. Where on earth are we going to find time in a must-win game every single week to bring off the opportunity to use a player like Nuneri in the same way that they've been able to use Kobe Minor? It's just simply uh, not happened. And Austin's correct my pronunciation as Mainu. I've seen both used. Um, my Manchester United supporting friend says Mainu as well, so I could be wrong, but uh, I've heard both used, so uh, uh, I guess there's differences. Maybe he'll tell us himself one day. So he says, hi Tom, uh, I didn't watch the Villa game last night. Did they field a strong team? And could this have been a bearing on Sunday's game, considering the only they are only two one up, and Emery's past selections for us and what he's done in those games. I didn't watch the game either because I was too busy uh, watching Fallout. Um, <laughs> but um, have a quick look at the uh, result. It was two one on the night, uh, which means it's still all to play for in the second leg. Their team was. Um, Martinez in goal, Concert at right back, Carlos and Torres at centre back, Dina at left back, uh, Bailey, Tillemans, Louise, Rogers, McGinn, Watkins. Yes, the answer is yes. They played a they played a strong team. Um, the only players that they could potentially have started are Musa Diaby, but Leon Bailey's had a fantastic season. Um, other than that, Alex Moreno maybe at left back. And yeah, I mean, they won't have Louise at um at the weekend because he's suspended. I imagine they may start their young 20-year-old. Uh, Irueg Bunam, um, young 20-year-old defensive midfielder, he could come into the team for the weekend game. But yeah, they went strong um, and they only just scraped by Lille. So uh, certainly a reason. Paul says, Fallout, any good? I've only watched episode one. And my goodness me, one of the best first episodes of an adaptation of a video game I have ever seen. If you've ever played the Fallout games, you'll love it. If you don't know what Fallout is, You'll love it. It is so good. Now, I can't speak for the rest of the series yet, but I've only watched the first episode. So no spoilers for anyone. No spoilers at all because people. It's, all the episodes have dropped, so you can watch the whole thing. Um, but amazing. Amazing piece of, of recreative work uh, in the field. It is unbelievable. Like, considering someone that was a big Halo fan when they were younger, watched the Halo series one and two, and was so gutted at how terrible... It is. If you want an example of how not to recreate the plot, the storylines, the characters, then look at the Halo TV series. I genuinely wouldn't recommend anyone sit through the bile that I had to sit through and watch. It's absolutely awful. Um, but the Fallout TV series is a lesson. And I've only watched the first episode, and yet I'm already bowled over by it. It was worth... That hour was better than the 16, 17, or however many I put into the Halo TV series. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, unbelievable. Anyway, we're going to round things off there, as we tend to do when we start going off on random tangents. Thank you so much for turning up this morning. And uh, as always, for tuning in and dropping a like. I did say that at the start of the show, we were seven subscribers away um, from reaching 56,000 subs. Oh, would you look at that? On the dot, as I click over, we have reached 56,000 subscribers. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. And uh, I really look forward to uh, speaking with you tomorrow about Mikel Arteta's press conference as a channel with now 56,000 subs. So thank you so much um, for the support that you continuously give the channel. The uplift that it brings to uh, myself and our community is amazing. And uh, it was our mission, of course, at the start of this year to see whether or not it would be possible 
to reach the Emirates Stadium capacity uh, of 60,000 uh, 60, subs. We're only 4,000 now, just under, uh, just over, sorry, away um, from that from that um, that milestone. So who knows? It might it might happen. It might not. But your support on this channel is brilliant. Best community that there is, period. And uh, I look forward to hopefully joining you uh, on this journey all the way through to well and beyond that as well. But thank you so much for listening. Please drop a like on the video. Please do subscribe if you're new. And as always, up the Arsenal.